Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rana Jawad, I'm convener of the MENA Social Policy Network and um, based at the University of Bath. So we're just welcoming you onto the Zoom call at the moment. Um, so welcome, everyone. It's a real pleasure to have you joining us on our monthly um, webinar series for the MENA Social Policy Network. Um, it's just great to have you all. So I, I don't want to say too much, and I just want to really introduce our amazing guest speaker. Um, so I shall fire away because time is of the essence, and we do need to finish at five minutes to 3 p.m. UK time um, to allow uh, Professor Jamal uh, time to go on to another meeting. So thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome, uh, and please let's all welcome together, Professor Amani Jamal, who is Dean of the Princeton School of Public International Affairs, Edwards S. Sanford Professor of Politics and Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University. I think Amani needs no introduction. She is a trailblazer, and we are all uh, uh, great admirers of our work, and it's a real honor and pleasure to have her uh, present um, a most recent uh, insights and work from the Arab Barometer Survey, given her extensive experience and background as well um, on the wider politics of the Middle East and North Africa region. Um, I will do no justice to her background, so I shall be brief because I would like to give her the floor. Um, she has authored several books, um, one of which is Barriers to Democracy, um, which explores the role of civic associations in promoting democratic effects in the Arab world. And this won the 2008 American Political Science Best Book Award in the Comparative Democratization section. Um, she is co-principal of the Arab Barometer Project, which is the winner of the best data set in the field of comparative politics um, and her, uh, for a, a particular award of the Liphard Preswarski Verba Dataset Award in 2010 and has secured over uh, several millions of dollars in grants for this and other projects from the Middle East Partnership Initiative. In 2006, she was named a Carnegie Scholar and holds a PhD from the University of Michigan. Um, and as I'm sure a lot of us know, her areas of specialization are the Middle East and North Africa, um, political behavior, political development and democratization, inequality, and a range of other topics related to ethnicity, gender, uh, and race. She'll be speaking to us today about um, the Arab uprisings um, using insights from the Arab Barometer Survey. Uh, we will listen to her for around half an hour or so. I shall try my best to chair and uh, then we will receive your questions uh, through the chat or in person. So um, thank you again and please let us all welcome Amani. Over to you. Thanks Amani. Thank you so much, Rena, for that wonderful introduction. It's very generous of you. It's a real uh, a great fortune and opportunity to be with all of you uh, this morning, um, our time, um, your afternoon. Um, thank you for turning out. Um, and today I was asked to talk uh, about our Arab barometer data set as a resource for social policy uh, on for those who work on the Middle East. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, if you have any, I, you know, I, I really, I very much like interactive sessions. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to chime in, stop me, we can clarify. Um, I, I'd rather, I'd rather us have a conversation than me talk for like 25 minutes straight, but um, I, I'm prepared to do that too. So I'm going to share uh, the screen. Um, and I can do this, I assure you. Uh, here we go. Everybody can see that, right? Okay, very good. Let me just start the presentation here. <clears throat> okay, so the title of the talk for today is, sorry, is the Arab Uprisings Revisited Evidence from a Decade of Arab Barometer Survey Data. Um, you know, as you know, uh, we have a, a, a very large team working on this. So while, while I'm presenting and I'm listed as the co-PI of the Arab Barometer, this project wouldn't be possible without the outstanding team that works with us on the Arab Barometer. Um, just about the Arab Barometer, we are the longest standing and the largest repository of publicly available data on ordinary citizen views in the Arab world. Princeton, it's Princeton University based nonpartisan research network that works with universities and research institutions throughout the region. 
From 2009 to 2021, we've conducted six waves of Arab barometer. We've surveyed in over 15 countries. We've conducted over 50 national surveys, and we've had interviews with over 75,000 Arab citizens. Uh, the, our emphasis, and something that I'm very proud of, is our emphasis is on data quality ach achieved through capacity building with regional partners. So we always work with regional partners. We never sort of just parachute in, conduct our research and leave. We have long-standing relationships with research networks um, in the region, and we've developed software that flags, you know, suspicious uh, interviews and other quality control issues. And I'd be happy to talk about this in the Q and A. Um, one of the things I'm really proud of in terms of the work that we do at the Arab Barometer is that when we're conversing with other barometers uh, across the globe, those barometers working on uh, public opinion work in their respective regions, we are often uh, sort of sharing our technology, sharing our ability to preserve data quality uh, control on, on, on the data, on what we're collecting and how we collect that data. So happy to discuss more in the Q&A. Some of the key findings over the last uh, decade is that the economy remains a key grievance among MENA citizens of all age groups. And while there are no age driven differences on a regional level, they are pronounced in Jordan and Morocco. Unlike the economy, there are stark, stark differences between younger and older generations in the desire to migrate both regionally and particularly in Jordan, Morocco and Egypt. Both age groups, however, are primarily motivated uh, uh, to migrate for economic reasons. And the narrow gap between young and old and overt preferences for political expressions of religion has almost entirely closed. So these are things that were sort of uh, addressed during the course of the presentation. There are other key findings. There are no significant differences between age groups in views of gender egalitarianism. Majorities of both young and old believe women should have rights to divorce and become head of state. This is something that we've tracked across the last 10 decades and we're seeing gradual improvement in attitudes towards gender egalitarianism. Age groups are also in unison regionally on support for the merits of democracy. However, Tunisia demonstrates a notable exception to this trend and I'll talk about quote unquote, uh, we just put out a piece in foreign affairs. It was released yesterday on uh, uh, the, the reversal of democracy in Tunisia what it means for further democratization in the region. Um, and I'd be more than happy to talk about that in the Q&A. Um, overall satisfaction with government performance remains low. This really hasn't changed for the last decade, unfortunately, despite the Arab Spring. More worryingly, majorities, but particularly the youth, feel powerless to do anything about this. And I wanna sort of make, make sure that we sort of talk about that. So we do break the data down by age group and cohorts because I think when we're looking at the last 10 years, it's not only important to sort of see where citizens on average are, but we're particularly uh, keeping our eye on the youth population because they're sort of going to be dealing with these challenges and these social and economic challenges uh, and political challenges in the next decade ahead of us. So when we look at employment le levels across MENA, this is coming from wave five of the Arab barometer, what you'll see across the board is that the unemployment levels for the youth populations in MENA remain drastically horrifying, in my opinion, right? Look at Algeria, you have a youth unemployment rate of the youth population about 67%, Morocco, 62%, Jordan, 48%, Sudan, 48%, Tunisia, 41%. Um, Lebanon today, this, is, this, this, is, this has gone off the charts with the economic collapse. Remember, this is before the the port explosion, and this is before the pandemic, quite honestly. Um, so this is not a very rosy story for our youth. When we look at uh, uh, how, how citizens evaluate the current economic situation across their countries, I'll just draw your attention to this graph over here. Outside of Kuwait, which is an oil rich country that distributes via rentier uh, mechanism, in every other Arab country, there is no majority that ranks their economic situation as uh, good or very good. Egypt under Sisi, we see that uh, there's more support or optimism about the economic trajectory. Um, again, this is basically uh, uh, you know, strong authoritarianism, maybe perhaps will lead to, to, to sort of better e economics. We sort of call this the China-Russia model. Um, and then in every other country, it's very sad. Look at Tunisia here. Um, and this is this is this is the our, our democratic poster child of the region. Um, so only seven percent say that the economic situation is good. 
The evaluation of the economy over time by age group, you'll see that the, uh, the youth slightly were more optimistic around the Arab Spring with about a third saying that the economy is good. They have joined their uh, older cohort. Now only a quarter say that the economy is good or very good. So across time, the youth population is becoming a little bit more disillusioned. Um, economic brief evaluations of the Jordan uh, economy over time by age group. What you'll see here is that this is where we see like the, the biggest drop uh, at the eve of the Arab Spring, the youth population, about 65% felt that the economy uh, was good or very good. Today, that percentage, uh, or in 2019, that percentage was a quarter. Uh, after COVID, it's gone down even further. Um, and then evaluation of Morocco uh, economy over time, again, the, the gains of the, uh, of the 2017 uh, sort of turn there have sort of fallen as well. So the econ economy remains, if, if you ask me what is the number one policy issue facing the region, people will talk about all the other issues. I would say, let's keep always the focus on the economy. If we are, if the jobs are not being created to absorb the youth populations, and this is a, not an uneducated youth base, right? We're talking about uh, actually in Tunisia, in Tunisia, just to sort of interject, uh, there was a report put out by the Economic Research Forum that basically uh, showed that 85% of university graduates cannot find employment. So this is, this is really a recipe for disillusionment. Um, when we think about, oh, and just really quick, well, well, we'll get to that, but in Tunisia, you'll see that across time, the, this, these charts have also fallen. The desire to migrate over time, uh, the, uh, when you look at the eve of the Arab Spring, about 46% of the youth said they wanted to migrate. Today, 46% of the youth still want to migrate, and they cite economic reason, reasons. The adult population is less likely wanting to migrate. If we sort of look at the economically challenged countries, your, uh, what I call Jordan, Tunisia, Lebanon right now, those numbers are far higher. Um, you know, in Lebanon, given the economic crisis facing the country, you know, I, we have a collaborative initiative with the American University of Beirut. Um, almost every colleague I speak to uh, in Beirut is trying to leave the country. So thinking about the Arab, Arab brain drain and what the Arab brain drain has done to economic and political development in the region, in terms of the region's own human capital, this is also devastating. Uh, the last statistic I saw on this, uh, estimated that about 60 to 70% of all PhD holders, all Arab PhD holders are living in the diaspora, are not living in the Middle East. So that means the region is not benefiting from its own human capital. So the reason for thinking about immigrating by age group, again, economic reasons are the story. This is why people are, are, are wanting to leave their countries. Uh, some will say political reasons, some will say security reasons, but the vast story here by age group and older generation is the economic story. And what you see is that the views on the democracy have remained rather static. Now we've been monitoring this since the Arab Spring uh, to see, you know, with the Arab Spring, with the momentum, with the push for democracy, do citizens support democracy more? Uh, so across time, what we see is that it's remained rather static. The youth population was about 29% uh, saying that uh, they agree or strongly, sorry, this is the wrong clip. This is, do, do you believe that the country, the economy is weak under democracy? So in other words, did democracy bring economic success or prosperity? That number has remained static. It's about th a third of the Arab population believes um, the third of the Arab population believes that um, the economy is weak under democracy. Um, and then when we ask this question in Tunisia, this is the one I wanna draw your attention to. In 2011, about 21% of the youth, 15% of the older generation believed the economy was weak. In other words, we see, we see faith in democracy to deliver economically. By 2019, that number is 43%. So about only 50% believe that democracy will deliver economic gains. When you look at actual per capita GDP in Tunisia, the per capita GDP adjusted for cost of living, right, was higher under Ben Ali in 2010 than it is today. So when we talk about, when we talk about uh, in terms of real purchasing power, when we talk about the economic gains linked to democracy, the uh, democracy has not delivered economically for the citizens of Tunisia. And a lot of people, even now in, in our subsequent wave six surveys, uh, majorities in Tunisia believe that they are willing to invest in a strong leader 
in a strong leader that can deliver economically then and be less democratic. So this populism model, this more personalistic uh, move towards ensuring that the economy improves across time. The percentage of people saying democratic systems are not affected by age group. What you see here is that about a third of the population believes that democ democratic systems are not effective. Look here at Tunisia, that number has skyrocketed over the last 10 decades, especially among the youth. 46% uh, of the youth believe democracies are not effective. Um, and then democratic systems are better than other systems by age group. Still, people have faith in democracy. So although they think it's not effective, although they believe it's not delivering economically, majority still believe that it's better than any other system. Um, and democratic systems are better than others by age group. In 2011, 78% said that the democratic systems are better than other age groups that fell to 72%. So a slight decline there, but nevertheless, though there is sort of some, some commitment to democracy, although the faith in democracy to deliver economically is not, is not there. In terms of satisfaction with government performance, uh, that has gone down across the board in all MENA countries, um, especially and, and, and among our youth. So only a quarter of the youth in 2019 believe that the government performance is, uh, is uh, uh, satisfactory. If we look at political interest, uh, you know, small, you know, less than, in, in, in no country does a majority of the population say they are interested in politics. Again, I think this is part of the disillusionment story. Um, you'll see that even among the youth, there was about 40% of the youth were, were engaged around the Arab springtime. Um, here, 37%, today that's 24%. So again, it's like, kind of, again, the, the being turned away from politics. Um, uh, this is a question about external relations and external ties, like how, how do you view your region vis-a-vis -vis external actors? Um, when we asked, uh, you know, and people sort of will say, well, are there cohort changes on perceptions of external actors, the role of external actors in the everyday life of Arab uh, uh, countries. So we asked the citizens what what external actor is perceived to be the greatest threat. You'll see uh, uh, Israel among the youth was cited as uh, the greatest threat, about 35% in the youth cohort and about 37% among the adults. Iran is something that we're tracking there. Again, it's very comparable. Um, the United States what you see here is 16% cited the United States, 15%. So we didn't see many differences based on cohort. So the, 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 these sort of opinions remain static uh, uh, across age, age groups. Um, we also asked in terms of uh, how people viewed support for Trump versus other leaders. The, really, the big takeaway is that Erdogan today is the most popular leader in the region. Um, so, so just look at every single country. Trump is the least popular, which is sort of uh, expected. Although in some countries uh, uh, and, and, and among some groups, he, is, he was popular. We can talk about that more specifically, but I wanna draw your attention that like in a, a country like Sudan, Jordan, Palestine, Iraq, Lebanon, Libya, Egypt, Erdogan has about more than 50% support across those countries. And then he's just trailing slightly below the 50% in, uh, uh, sorry, I, I must just stop. In, 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 this is, sorry, in Iraq, um, and then much lower support in Lebanon, Libya, and in Egypt. So again, Erdogan has really sort of benefited uh, from the last decade of geopolitics in the region. Um, and you know that was a pivot, to the extent that that was a pivot towards authoritarianism. Um, I know that uh, uh, that, that that's sort of where the sensibilities of our the populations are. And again, we need to sort of probe this, right? Is it really support for uh, an authoritarian turn in leadership or is Erdogan pitching and the way he's uh, uh, pivoting uh, his leadership towards the Arab world, is, it's, it's basically paying off at least in terms of citizen support. Uh, the good news is the Biden is far more popular than Donald Trump. So here's Trump in the orange, Biden is in the blue. Uh, Algeria, Biden is very popular. Although, you know, look at uh, the category of equally bad. A, qu a quarter of Algerians believe both are equally bad. A quarter of Jordanians believe both are equally bad. 42% of Lebanese believe both are equally bad. Um, 
this is coming from the wave six, 24% uh, of Libyans, 21% of Moroccans, 15% of Tunisians, but Biden by and large is the story, but we also have a lot of people saying, I don't know. Um, so we can take that, we can be a little bit skeptical, um, but in Lebanon, especially among the uh, uh, among among uh, um, among the Christ, uh, the Christian minority, we found that Donald Trump was more popular. Um, so we can talk about that in a little bit. Um, and this is what our foreign affairs piece sort of highlights: is that the region uh, really really does welcome stronger ties with China. Um, at least China seen at least in the region not to be political or more apolitical. Uh, so it's a pivot away from the US and perhaps even Europe, although in other surveys, just among the European countries, um, everyone should know that Germany is very, very popular in the Arab world um, in, in terms of uh, how, how it's seen in terms of its donor assistance and its assistance towards civil society. But nevertheless, when we look at economic relations with China, uh, the percent preferring stronger relations, again, almost in every single country, uh, you see close to a majority wanting stronger economic relations with, with China. Um, in terms of economic relate, stronger economic relations with the US, it's really sort of driven by Jordan and Sudan, maybe Tunisia and Morocco. Stronger economic relations with Russia, here we see Libya, Tunisia, um, and again, you know, Jordan and Sudan. So like, you know, um, in Jordan, almost Jordanians want stronger economic ties with everyone, but again, the economic struggles in Jordan are also very severe. Um, and so when we sort of look at higher support for ties with China than US and Russia, sorry, uh, China's in the blue, you'll see that China is becoming more popular in many, in many Arab countries, just like to sort of like eyeballing the popularity, except maybe down here uh, in uh, Egypt. Um, we did ask questions about the Abrahamic Accords. Did they receive uh, support from the populations in the region? So attitudes towards the Abraham Accords uh, in no countries is wave six in our in the five countries where we were able to ask the question. Uh, you'll see that in no country outside of Lebanon did we get more than 10% support for the Abraham Accords. Um, and then when we broke down the Lebanese data, you'll see that 50% of the Christian population uh, was positive about them, 11% uh, of the Druze population, less than 1% of the Shia population, and 6% of the Sunni population. So that's my presentation, and I really look forward to your your questions uh, during this during the Q and A session. That's really great. Thank you so much, Amani. So lots to take in there, and I'm sure all of us were seeing connections with a range of questions and research that we're all uh, connected with. So, colleagues, um, you can just unmute yourself and ask your question or you can post your question in the chat. Um, and I will try my best to navigate through all these. Oh, and I've got a hand up, very good. So there was a kind of a comment and a question already posted by Professor Valentin Mugaddam, who is not far away geographically from where you are, Amani. So yeah. I'll and a, good, a good friend, hi Val. Yeah. And then we will move on to the colleagues that are kindly putting their hands up. So I hope I'll, I'll um, follow the correct order. So yeah, um, Valentin, thank you so much for your comment. So it's about the yeah. support for Mr. Erdogan. Would you like to read that out or shall I read your comment? Thank you, I'm, I'm, I'm back. So <laughs> yeah, um, Amani, it's great to see you. Great to see you too, uh, Rana and everyone else. Um, Thanks, um, uh, Amani, for all the fantastic work that you do at uh, Arab Barometer. Of course, you know that I'm a big fan and I use your work a lot. But, you know, regarding the support for, um, for Turkey and Erdogan, um, you know, as I've been going over these, um, uh, these uh, uh, results, uh, it, it appears to me that the questionnaire was done actually before um, Turkey's economy started to deteriorate. So I'm wondering what you think about that. Shall we wait until the next set of uh, survey results to see if Erdogan is still as popular and as much of a role model um, as he was um, in uh, the past few years? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question, Val. So a uh, wave seven is right now in the field and we yeah. do have we, we, we do have repeat questions of this. Um, if you ask me to hypothesize, Val, given that uh, where we have qualitative evidence about the logics that citizens are deploying via Erdogan, uh -huh. 
it's less about the economic success of Erdogan's oh. church, or at least during that time period, and more about his political pivoting, um, how he positions himself uh, in, in the region. Um, hmm. um, uh, and 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 so that's going to be interesting to see if his uh, you know his his more authoritarian turn his, his the economic declines right now in Turkey whether that's going to sort of sweep individuals off of that model. Hmm. Okay. Thanks. Hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Val. And there's a few hands up. I'm just going to go through the order that I can see. So, Amani Mehrez, over to you. Yes. Hello. Thank you so much, Amani, and really great to see you again. Great, great um, to see you too, Amani. Two questions. Um, so, I mean, the R bar meter data is very clear, and, um, and my question is particularly to the Tunisian case. I mean, all indicators, financial indicator, economic indicators, corruption, uh, satisfaction with the system, they've been always like uh, deteriorating since um, post Arab Spring, post the, the uprisings. But still, we find a lot of work since 2011, maybe until 2020, before the like Kaiser Said uh, attempted coup in Tunisia basically happened, portraying Tunisia as this very prosperous, positive picture in the region, right, of democratic model. But very, very few people basically use those indicators. I mean, the, the, the indicators are very clear. It's showing a very negative trend and it's going down yeah. from wave to wave in the R bar meter data. I'm just curious about your thoughts about that, why there have been this um, uh, attitudes about the Tunisian case. And my second question is uh, basically I'm curious about wave seven. Uh, what what new indicators or what new variables have been included there compared to the previous ones? Thank you. So thank you so much, Emeni, um, uh, for the question. It's good to see you. Um, so the first question on Tunisia. I mean, this is this is really important. And what why is it why is it the case? And so in the foreign affairs piece that we just put out yesterday, uh, we, we're sort of arguing that for all the talk about supporting democracy, supporting democracy, you know, privileging democracy, right? Um, very little was done to support Tunisian democracy. And the way we interpret that, that, you know, you can't just look at, uh, you make sure that there's elections, right? You know, too much, the democracy promotion establishment has pr uh, prized elections as the only sort of indicator of democratic success. And I'm not trying to say that, the, that elections aren't important. I mean, I think elections are sort of like the pillar of democracy, but the elections alone will not deliver stable democracy. The, the one of the most robust correlations for us as students of, uh, of politics, the one of the most robust correlations that we know that exists is that there's a strong correlation between economic development and democracy the world over. You know, it, it, it's a correlation. We can we can get at the causal story if you know uh, you know researchers are still grappling with that. But basically, there is this understanding that democracies struggle when you don't reach a certain threshold of economic development, going back to Jaworski's work also on this. And the fact that the, you know, you know, and again, I'm not trying to say that it's the donor community's responsibility to build economic development in Tunisia, but, but the package of democracy promotion initiatives needs to sort of include and ensure that Tunisians can build uh, the basis of a strong economy, or at least, you know, bring in external investors, or at least sort of move the country in that direction, especially when you get the internationals involved, the international organizations involved in, 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 in conditionality and things of that sort. This is where, where there could, there, not to use conditionality leverages, but the conditionality leverages sometimes are costing Tunisia economically even more devastating effects in the immediate time, right? So you have a youth population that needs to be employed and you don't want countries, you know, in this era of also, you know, a liberal market economics where the, the public sector is shrinking, you don't, if, if you don't want the public sector to absorb the youth, then, then how, how, do, how does a country like Tunisia compete? Um, again, and I also want to say just also other structural conditions, I can go on and on about this, the fact that the region during the Arab Spring, I mean, the, the, the devastation in the region of both external and regional actors, uh, uh, promote, you know, uh, contributing to these violent, violent cycles, whether it was in Syria, whether it was in li neighboring Libya for Tunisia, whether it was the uh, Iraq, right, all of these conflicts, it, we also know that investment and uh, uh, inv external investment, foreign direct investment is not gonna happen at reasonable rates if the 
region remains unstable and the climate remains unstable. And in almost every single country, those bordering Tunisia and those not, the region has been very unstable in the last decade. And this is a problem. Um, to your other question, MNE, um, uh, Rana had the same question. We do have new indicators. We're, we're trying to get more precise on like social policy measures domestically moving more from the macro to the micro. I would be happy to share our instrument because we're in the field, but I would be happy to share our instrument. Um, I'll make sure our survey team um, can send you and, and anybody interested in the instrument, we can send it out. That's Thank, it. You. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, over to Ross. Hi, Ross. You're, you're on mute, Ross. <laughs> unmuted the wrong thing thank you rana thank you amani that was a that was a wonderful presentation and uh, um of great interest to me um uh particular interest in youth unemployment across the whole the whole region and uh, among many questions i'd be glad to ask you uh, how how much more um, uh, reliable is the data that you're able to correct on your barometer for youth unemployment levels right across the region, say compared to uh, international labor organizations? I would expect yours would be in a much stronger position, but is that right? And, and if so, how? Yeah, this is a really good question, Ross, and I appreciate it. I think our data is more reliable, not because it's our data, because we're tapping into the informal economy, whereas I believe ILO is still basically on that kind of like official government statistics, formal unemployment. The governments, as you know, always want to depress those numbers. Um, so we're asking people directly, are you employed? How long have you been employed? What kind of employment sector are you involved in? And if you're unemployed, uh, how many years have you been un unemployed? I mean, we, we even have uh, some data on the number of years people have been un uh, unemployed. Um, again, this is again, devastating, right? Uh, because, um, you know, the education levels in the region are increasing. Families are disproportionately investing a lot of their, their resources into educating their children. And then it's among the educated youth that the unemployment rates are even higher. So the job markets have not come uh, kept up with the human capital. The human capital, quite honestly, has not also kept up with the 21st century economy um, in terms of you know the, the turn towards technology and things of that sort. So it's sort of it, you sort of, when, you, when you get into this uh, uh, space, it becomes layered uh, over and over. And you, you know this is where Tunisia, I think, would have benefited. You know, and you know. And, 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 you know, he, and I'm, I'm complaining now, but when I would get in conversations, you know, people would be much more interested in, in talking about, well, why, what's, what, why is the percent of Tunisian youth attracted to ISIS? Far more interested in this question, right? Then let's say, well, how do we get to like the economic building blocks of promoting economic sustainability in Tunisia? Well, let me tell you about the youth. So everybody started talking about like the Tunisian exceptionalism and the legacy of political Islam and culture there, which, you know, there was, I'm not saying that that didn't play a factor, but when the Tunisian youth couldn't find jobs and ISIS was propagating on giving everybody a thousand dollar stipend, a car, a, a, ha a rental apartment, a wife, and a gun, uh, a lot of Tunisian youth, because the borders were less sort of controlled by the authoritarian legacy, found their way to Syria. It, it, it wasn't the case that all of a sudden Tunisians had this radicalized sort of impulse that was being contained by Ben Ali. And this is what happens when Arab countries democratize. Um, so that's me ranting a little bit, Russ, uh, a little bit more, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Insightful, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that's great, thank you very much. Okay, over to Mohammed Dia. Hi, Amini. Um, Hi, Mohammed. Thank you for the presentation. So I have so many questions, but I'm gonna stick to, I'll uh, try uh, two methodological questions, and one about um, the matching between perception and reality. Uh, so um, so um, can you explain why the last wave is divided into uh, three parts? um or two parts um because i'm using it and i don't know if uh there is any problem with that um the second question is about 
um, if there is any variation in the willingness to respond to, to, to respond to surveys throughout time since 2011 and now, because people have been disconnected. Like my mother don't want to listen to the news anymore. Uh, yeah. She doesn't know what's happening in Ukraine. And, uh, and so, uh, so I wonder if there is here some kind of, not just the Arab Baramir survey, but in general, uh, but maybe surveys are, are capturing people who are still somehow interested in politics and willing to, uh, to uh, respond or who still trust uh, um, surveys in general, because local surveys uh, organization are controversial. Um, and the la very last point is about the, um, uh, I wonder if there is, I think, that, so there is a gap between the perception of inequality and uh, what recent reports on evolution of poverty and inequality in Tunisia since 2011 are showing. So uh, I'm actually, for people who are interested, uh, I'm gonna uh, share share it with you. There are at least two reports showing that um, the uh, income inequality, more specifically labor inequality, uh, were declining. Um, same thing regarding poverty. Uh, and I think the uh, sources are reliable. Um, but at the same time, we have the Arab Amir, we have the World Value Survey showing and increasing the perception of inequality. So here, uh, I, I think we tend to assume that there is a direct connection between uh, economic development uh, and economic indicators as like one, as a, uh, all, all together and perception of inequality. But, but there is, I think, something that we're missing. Maybe maybe the, the public discourse regarding economic performance of governments have something uh, to do with, um, is a part of the causal mechanism and we're somehow uh, missing it so far. Yeah, no, Mohammed, those are really good questions. So let me sort of uh, 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 answer them in the order. In terms of our response rate, our response rate remains rather high, uh, especially for survey work. Like in the US, sometimes on all these sort of uh, surveys, you get 5 10, 15% response rate, and it's considered phenomenal. Uh, our response rate is closer to 70%, 75% in some countries. So our response rate remains very high. And the reason is, uh, you know, we knock on the doors, we introduce what the surveys does, it's, it's capturing your opinions about everyday life, political, social, economic, and like you said, Muhammad, people are disillusioned, but they see this as an opportunity, okay, let me tell you our opinion. And so in, in a way, uh, people say sometimes, well, thank us, like they, they spend about 45 minutes taking a survey, and we don't pay anybody to take our survey, we don't have any incentive structure. Um, and people thank us because it's sort of like uh, somewhat, I suppose, therapeutic to be able to sort of <laughs> to call it as you see it. So this is for us, uh, in a way, I hate to say it, uh, it works for it. It, it, it works for us. Um, uh, for the question on political interest, um, Muhammad, I sort of totally see it. I see it with my mother as well. She doesn't want to listen to any state news anymore. But what she is doing. Um, and I'm sure it's not only my mom and thank God she's not on the Zoom and we're not going to share the Zoom link, but she spends so much time on Facebook and WhatsApp and all the fake news that's circulating in the region. I worry about this also, not because of my mom only, but for the region, right? Um, fake news is a huge industry right now that circulates on social media in the region. And because our populations have a lack of faith in state media, they have a lack of faith in external media, right? Um, then the fake news industry can flourish in ways that 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 might be you know very disastrous. For example, we're seeing direct relationship between uh, vaccination uptake and can, you know borderline conspiracy theories about the vaccines, right? And this these are this is what's propagating um, on social media. Now, for all the talk about this is me ranting again. For all the talk about uh, Facebook and the the, the 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 you know information capitalist interest really working hard and dedicated to solving uh, the information warfare problem, um, it, it's 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 not doesn't appear to be the case because the algorithms are set up in such a way that basically this this is the the material and information that is spreads faster and quicker and and gets the uptake. Um, and if you look even at Facebook, I was in another call with the United, United Nations uh, 
conference. I don't know, Val, if you were on that same call, but in one of the papers um, that was presented was amazing. Of, of all the fake news that was taken down by Facebook, 83% of it was in the OECD and the US and only 13% in the developing world. And so that means that 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 our the global south, if you may, is disproportionately being going to be affected by fake the fake news industry in in areas where, with all due respect, the the, the, the structural challenges are already there, um, and the media environments are not free. So, Mohammed, sorry, you opened up a can of worms for me that I'm worried about moving forward. Also, I try to be optimistic. Wallahi, I do. Just uh, just for the record, um, <laughs> in my daily life, I try to be. I try to wake up with a very optimistic view. View on inequality, Muhammad. Um, again, for the same reasons that Ross sort of highlighted, um, I worry about official government statistics on unemployment. Um, but even if those inequality, like uh, when anybody's present, and I haven't read them, I need to read your reports. But maybe I shouldn't be putting out myself out there. But if inequality is being reduced and everybody's income is rising, that's different than inequality being reduced and everybody's income is falling. So we want to be make sure to see what's happening in those areas. Okay, this is great. Thank you. So we've got 10 minutes uh, for colleagues to be aware and still quite a few questions. So uh, we've got Iftikhar and then we have Sharbel and then I'll try and get some questions from the chat. So thank and you. I'll try to be brief, uh, I don't know. Right, uh Thank you, Professor Tamal, for uh, your presentation. I know you, you didn't get enough time to talk about uh, uh, gender-based uh, diversity in your respondents. So I was just wondering what would be the ratio, and especially I know that humanities and liberal arts are not very popular globally, and especially in our part of the world, but there is a large number of women now in the universities. And despite the fact that many of them get married and uh, go back to their homes and kitchens, but when you look at uh, you know situations like Bangladesh or a little bit of Central Asia, I think this uh, women sector is becoming more active in economy and also in uh, the civil sector, uh, you know, civil society. And given you know, uh, I mean, the frustrations with the uh, with the Al Qaeda and Islamic State and such Islamist groups, do you see that uh, Muslim modernism is coming back? And this revivalism is going down. Muslim modernism, I mean. Modernism. This was the old age old contestation and people started saying that uh, Islamism is coming back. But now with all these uh, setbacks, uh, even Taliban going around and you know asking for help. So it appears that uh, maybe there is a little window for Muslim modernists where women could play a very important role. Right, so this is a very good question. I'm gonna share my screen because I was also hoping somebody would ask me about uh, the gender breakdown of education and religiosity as well. So we can sort of just be informed. Uh, uh, like, sorry, I, I myself can be informed and rely on my data as well. Um, but I do wanna say something iftikhar before I, uh, I, I, I pivot over. I believe as my colleague, I was very well socialized as a graduate student reading my colleague's work, uh, Val Magadam's work. I believe the roots of female problems are there are cultural barriers, but the roots of the problems are economic, right? And, and, and why do I say this? We spent a lot of time, my research team and I in Jordan talking to young women who are educated and why they are opting out of the job market. And yes, there are pressures, there are cultural pressures, there are patriarchal pressures, but at the end of the day, the most common response is why would I have to pay you know, money for daycare, for transportation, deal with the patriarchy to go make less money than it would cost me to work to begin with. And so if the labor market does not incentivize young women to work with their degrees, they will opt to stay at home. Yeah. Uh, so this is a big problem. Um, but let me show you now um, my the, 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 the education question. Um, do you all see my screen again? Okay, so here is, I'm just not gonna start the present, but here is higher education in MENA by, uh, you know, this is secondary versus higher education. Um, so you'll see that a third of the population in Algeria has a degree of higher, you know, uh, have, has moved beyond high school, a quarter in Egypt, 31%, 27% in Iraq, Jordan, uh, Kuwait, very high levels here, um, Lebanon, 41%, Libya, 69%, uh, 50, about 52% in Sudan, and then 21% and 18% in, in, in Tunisia and Yemen. But when we break this down by gender, and I want to call your attention here, 
the, the female male gap in higher education is really narrowing. It's, it's closing down. So look at here, it's, it's a spread of five percentage points that favors men. It's here, a percentage, uh, eight, Egypt, eight percentage point that favors men. Um, six percentage points in Iraq that favors men. But then in some countries like Kuwait and most of the Gulf countries, women, women uh, uh, across the board hold more degrees in higher education than their male counterparts. In Lebanon, the advantage is with women. In Libya, it's female. So I just wanna draw your attention to this. So women are becoming more and more educated, um, but the job market is not keeping up. So, and, and you know, we could talk about why, why uh, you know, and I do believe that the cultural barriers that kept women out of higher education 20, 30 years ago, those norms are shifting. And um, we do also see, just if I have it here, I had it in another prison, I wanna show it. Well, I'm jumping around, but I wanna just make sure that my story lines up. Um, I wanna tell the story that, that lines up. If we sort of look at, sorry, women's rights, and this is the religiosity question that you asked me about. When we look at this question, this is a question I like to look at. This is one of the key indicators on gender equality, which is, do you believe a woman could become president or prime minister? Because as you know, Pali Iftikhar, the <laughs> argument has always been that, uh, you know, going back to Islamic jurisprudence and the two witnesses and this and that and the other. Uh, so, so look at the youth population, the population that is 18 to 29. So the older generation, it has not, it has not changed much, but uh, what we're seeing across time that the number among the youth has gone up by 10 percentage points. That is pretty good. It's slow movement over the decade, but it's good movement. Um, and so this, this, uh, this, and still here, iftikhar, women support this question a lot more than the younger men. So this, we still have some work needs to be done. And this is why gender empowerment workshops should not only focus on women, but on society wide, uh, in terms of policy, think about policy implications, the entire society needs to sort of get on board uh, some of these, these projects. But when we look at really, uh, let me show you two, two slides. You asked about political Islam. Here's the issue. Uh, across time among our youth population, the percent of MENA citizens saying laws should be based entirely or mostly on Sharia law. Now remember, Sharia law is not monolithic. It means different things to different populations. But the worry is, is that as po the political and economic situation continues to, to, to deteriorate, you'll see more support for these alternative modalities of governance. Even while support for the role of religious clerics having influence over government by age group, that's on the decline. And this is because you sort of see that the politics with the Muslim Brotherhood in the region has sort of shifted across time. So that it might be an opportunity. So while uh, political actors, uh, Islamic political actors are losing support, there's still this idea of grasping to some sort of alternate uh, uh, system, uh, it, it still tracks well. And so this is something that we want to be, you know, I always say that, you know, some of the, the roots of radicalization are not only in uh, in theology, not not not. I'm sorry, in, in theological misinterpretation, but they are also in economic grievances. Economic grievances lead to radicalization. So we keep on our eye on. Um, I say this also. Just one last slide, iftikhar, just to sort of paint the portrait. Um, I had a I, here we go. Religiosity. So what you'll see that is the percent of people saying that they're religious, uh, still uh, religiosity is, 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 you know, is, is very important in MENA, especially in Iraq, Egypt, Yemen, Morocco, maybe Sudan, but in, like, so a third in Palestine. Um, but then it's not as important in, in, in other countries, Tunisia, Algeria, Libya. Um, but when you break it down by gender, uh, fee, women are far more religious uh, than their male counterparts, or at least they say they are. Um, and again, you know, if if you know, if you look at some of the literature on, uh, you know, the role of religion in terms of in female empowerment, and do women derive any sort of empowering effects from religion? But going back to Sabah Mahmoud, I think Val, you've written a little bit about this as well. Um, uh, the, the evidence here sort of supports that. So I can go on and on, but I did want to show you the portrait of all the the data slides here. I'm pulling out different presentations. That's all very rich. Thank you, Amani. So we've got uh, Sherbil up next. And just to say, there are a couple of colleagues who posted questions in the chat. 
Um, one about whether you include, you may include the Arab Gulf countries in the future. Um, and also the, uh, I think it's the, the Kurdish, um, uh, Kurdistan, the Kurdish area of Iraq. I think whether they will be included in the survey, but you may want to look at those while we hear Sherbel's question and hopefully try to finish on time. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, over to you, Sherbel. Yes, uh, first of all, yes, thank you so much, Amani, uh, for the presentation. Um, uh, I also wrote a question in the chat, but I would like to uh, say it here. Uh, the relationship between political and the economics, because if the economic situation is bad, then it is a reason for efforts to change in politics, but also uh, economic challenges are uh, also like uh, obstacles for people to be engaged in politics at the same time. Like it's a vicious cycle. And my question is, uh, I heard in many Arab Springs, like the goals of this movement, of youth movements, basically, were to change the system, the political system, but uh, it was less evident about economic slogans or economic priorities uh, for many countries, maybe. Uh, I would like to see if you have any piece of data about um, potential, maybe, uh, opportunities for uh, political changes or uh, if uh, the youth expressed uh, any uh, awareness development, uh, any uh, like if their awareness of public life has been evolved uh, during the past years. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Sherbel. And I'll try to sort of answer all the questions. The Gulf countries, really quickly. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to survey in the Gulf. We we have to do it with government permissions. We're not getting the necessary permissions to proceed the way we'd like to, unfortunately. Um, uh, you know, we, we, where we can work, we, we, we definitely will want to work. In terms of um, uh, the Kurdish populations, uh, it's a very important group. Um, my hope is that we will capture more and more of them um, in our subsequent surveys. Um, I believe, it, and Cheryl, you, to your point about uh, the economic grievances and how central they were in the Arab uprising. So we actually, it's a good thing, if you go to our 2012 data set, which is our second wave, we, that was right after the Arab Spring, and we were able to survey in Egypt right after the Arab Spring for the first time. And we asked people, did you participate in the protests? And this was in, in, these were environments, both in Tunisia and Egypt. These were environments of political openness. And then we asked the protest questions in other countries. And we looked at the people who said, yes, we protested. And what did they rank as their number one reason why they protested? By far, the story was economic grievances. So it, it sort of really conforms to the slogan, uh, bread, dignity, and freedom. So I want to also say that it's not that freedom was not important. Um, and freedom meaning political freedoms. Um, but unfortunately, you know, as, as, as the, the, you know, people, you know, they, they, they talk about economic dignity, they talk about political dignity. And, and for the people, when we ask also even people qualitatively, Sharwa, uh, when we talk to people about democracy, and we get into the open ended, like, what does democracy really mean? They'll always talk about fairness, justice, equality, and a lot of that is economic and, you know, ma'amala, how people treat one another and how people treat one another. There's no corruption. There's no economic, uh, uh, you know, uh, th th there's a government that is not corrupt, that redistributes equally and fairly. So the economic story is big in terms of how people understand and appreciate democracy. And the truth is, Sharbal, just to make sure, it's not only an Arab story, right? When the economy goes bad in every single country, uh, People will produce leaders that are very problematic. So just FYI. <laughs> yeah. That's like people and Darren, right? Yeah. Sorry, yeah, thank you. I think, yeah, to give you time to go to your next meeting, I'm sorry that I know there's a few more hands up, but I think we're gonna have to bring the webinar to a close. I think, Amani, we will invite you next year, all being well, and to continue the conversation, I think, because clearly you'll have new data and we'll have ever increasing questions. Um, but I think for now, please, if we can just thank everyone and all colleagues um, who've attended for this very rich conversation. Um, and I hope perhaps people might stay in touch uh, online directly and, uh, and we keep the conversation going. So thank you again and very best wishes. And thank you as always to Olivia and Islam who work behind the scenes to get this all together. Um, so we will stay online, but you are 
free to leave uh, the webinar when you are ready. Thank you, everyone, and well done. Let's have a Nicole, I, I, I got to stop sharing. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a great pleasure to be with you this morning, and I look forward to uh, being with you again soon. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.